Hi, and welcome to this live reading from The Crocodile Makes No Sound, The Lord Hani Mysteries by N.L. Holmes, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1 Already the third month of the summer season is upon us, Hani thought as he gazed about his garden. The black gland had begun to pray for a successful inundation for high waters and their rich forerunners, the red and green waves to fecundate the fields. Once the people of Kemet had prayed to Amun-Ra and Hopi, god of the flood. Now Hani wasn't sure to whom they were officially expected to offer their prayers and gifts. To the Aten, he supposed, the only god formally recognized by their king, Neferkapura. Certainly not to Amun-Ra, the hidden one whose name and cult had become Anathamu. Hani's beloved city of Waset, once the capital of the upper kingdom and home of the world's greatest temple, had emptied as the bureaucrats had departed for the for the new city of the horizon, and the tens of thousands of priests and lay employees of the god left without occupation or income had grown more and more restless, more and more dangerous. That I should have lived to see such a thing, Hani said, shaking his head. Much had changed in the four years Neferkapura had ruled alone after the death of his father, Nemaatra, the Magnificent, and Hani, for one, would have said none of those changes were good. His family tomb had been desecrated. His wife, a chantress of the Hidden One, had been locked out of the Ipith Isut, the great temple of Amun-Ra, along with all the other clergy. Hani had been forced by his conscience to drop out of active service in the diplomatic corps, no longer able to enforce a foreign policy he neither understood nor respected. But no one had seized his property, at least, so he still had his garden, his retreat, his hidden place of safety, his little slice of the field of reeds on earth. Drawing a deep breath, Hani let his eyes flow fondly over his garden, the trees he and his brother had planted thirty years before, the flowers, the long pool where his beloved ducks played, and the cool whitewashed house set in the middle, where he and Pippi had played as children and now Hani's own children lived happy lives, as they would until they grew up and moved off to their adult homes. Dawn had just begun to spread its sweet pale light over the walled garden. The birds awakened, twittering and calling. Kanit, his pet heron, stalked silently around the perimeter of the pool in search of unwary frogs, lifting her burnished legs with angular grace. In the sycamores, the crickets were falling silent, and the cicadas had not yet begun their roar. Hani drew a deep breath until the farthest corners of his lungs filled with the pure fragrant air of the morning. This was his favorite hour. Despite the disturbing news that every new day inevitably brought, dawn restored his sense of ballast, balance, of mott, and his certitude that everything would be all right in the end. Having mentally sung his little song of joyful greeting to the rising sun like the baboons of Ra, Hani made his way back through, through the mat that hung over the door of the house to keep out the flies. No one else was up yet except some of the servants. He could hear the splash of water in the kitchen and a small thunder of wood for the oven dropped on the earthen floor. No longer did Pa Kiki, his second son, have to get up at dawn to go to school at the House of Life. The Perank was closed along with the temple that housed it. Hani and his father, both scribes, were putting the finishing touches to the boy's education. Soon Pakiki would go to Akit Aten to live with his brother and work at some low-level job in the Hall of the Royal Correspondence, beginning his rise through the ranks. Hani planted himself in front of the little shrine in his salon where a small statue of the Hidden One and homely images of Tewurit, the Great One, and the Dwarf God Bess, protectors of women and children, were honored with flowers and bowls of grain. These days, every shrine was supposed to, fe supposed to feature some steel of the sun disk and the royal family, even in private devotions, but he didn't feel that kindly toward his ruler and his ruler's god. If he'd brought an Aten steel home, Hani could imagine that his wife, Nebnefer, would say, she whose father and brother had each served as third prophet of Amun-Ra. Yet Hani was uneasy about given, giving some officious visitor an opening to carry dangerous tales about his lack of loyalty. He had enough against him already. Perhaps I ought to get at least a small one. Hani drifted toward the kitchen, following his nose. He hoped the heavenly fragrance of baking meant the cook would soon take some fresh bread out of the oven. Hani was hungry, hungry for bread and hungry for life. It was dawn in the season before the inundation, after all. Time for good things to begin once more. One could believe on such a morning in the cycle of creation that after the grim, confusing years of the immediate past— good wood roll around again. 
Later that morning, Hani's secretary and son-in-law, Maya, arrived, ready to begin dictation. The little man, too, was in a twinkling mood. He and Sathura must still have a rousing evening, Hani chuckled. It still seemed impossible that his 17-year-old second daughter was a Nebit Pur, a mistress of the house, and she'd traded her maiden's braids for the long locks of a married woman. Good morning, Lord, Lord Hani. I have these fair copies of the letters for you. Shall I read them aloud for your approval? Maya seated himself cross-legged on the floor and unhitched his pen case from his shoulder. Thanks to the understanding of his superior, the High Commissioner, Lord Pactamas, Hani had been permitted to work in a domestic capacity rather than resign outright from his post. He hadn't been sent abroad for a year, and he had seen to his duties from home, showing up at the capital from time to time, just often enough not to be conspicuously conspicuously absent from the roster of assignments. Go ahead, Maya. I'll stop you if I hear anything I want to change. Maya unrolled the first of the documents and began to read it aloud, but Hani's thoughts drifted in and out as he remembered the troubles of conscience that had bumped his career off the expected road. Let me look at that, son, he said, reaching out a hand. I'm distracted and didn't absorb it. He took the papyrus from the secretary and began to read. He had to anchor his attention firmly to avoid slipping away again to the garden, to the river, to the reeds where the waiting birds he loved awaited him. All at once, Hani was conscious, conscious of a rush of bare footsteps and a swirl of skirt bearing down on him. He dragged his eyes away from the letter to see that Neferet, his youngest, had approached with her usual impetuous, impetuosity and was standing in front of him, hands on hips. "'What can I do for you, my love?' he said, smiling at the sight of her dressed like a young lady, her child's sidelock transmuted into the tiny braids of maidenhood. I can't believe it, the last of our children almost grown. I've decided something, Papa, she said earnestly, and seated herself on the floor beside him, pulling up her skirt to cross her legs with greater ease. At thirteen, she was still the stocky, broad-shouldered little hoyden he loved despite the dress. I've decided I want to be a physician, a sunnit. Is this something new? I don't believe you've ever mentioned it. I thought you wanted to be a horse, said Maya with a straight face. Hani tried not to laugh. Nefret shook her head, impatiently sending her braids flying. Oh, that was when I was a little girl. I mean, I did want to be a chantress of Amun, but... She shrugged with an eloquent lift of her the eyebrows. Although the impossibility of serving the Hidden One these days was a serious matter, Hani smiled nonetheless, because Nefret took after his side of the family and couldn't carry a tune. Neither was she, especially Lissom, should she be inclined to serve as a temple dancer. Her dance style had about it more enthusiasm than grace, her father thought tenderly, unlike her two sisters. Why, that's a noble aspiration, my dear. You'll have to study hard. Perhaps the priests of Sekhmet at Sao have a school that accepts girls. I'm smart. I'm smarter than Pakiki. Do I have to know how to read and write? I honestly don't know. Most doctors seem to, but I'm not aware of any women in the scribal schools, so maybe women physicians don't. We could teach you, couldn't we, my lord? offered Maya with a glance at his father-in-law. You wouldn't need to know the formal speech of the gods, just script. She set her elbow out on her knee and propped her chin on her fist, staring first at Maya, then at her father. I wonder if there are doctors who take care of animals. I can't imagine there aren't, Hani said, recalling his days as an army scribe. The king's fancy chariot horses certainly had a doctor. He cocked an eyebrow at her. But in the army, they're all men. Nevret nodded pensively. What about cats and pet herons? Hani was so overcome with affection for this suddenly serious girl that he reached out and tugged her braids with a smile. I don't know. You could start a whole new specialization. Be the first heron doctor. I could. She got to her feet, seemingly unaware or untroubled, that her skirt was caught up in the crack of her buttocks. Let me go talk to Quinnett and see what she thinks about it. Maya at his side was tiki-ing openly. Hani managed not to laugh until his youngest daughter had skipped away. Don't ever change, he thought, his heart full. The two men settled back to work. The sun had swung from one side of the room to this noon position, its long matunatal shafts growing shorter until they no longer pierced the clearest stories, when Hani scrawled to his feet and stretched. I guess we're finished for the day, Maya. You can make good copies of those letters I just dictated, and we'll go from there in the morning. At the end of the week, I'll take them up to the Hall of the Royal Correspondence. Count on me, Lord Hani, Maya knelt to gather his writing implements and rolls of papyrus. He looked up at Hani with a sudden anxious expression. Sahadhura and I are having dinner at Mother's tonight. Concerned by his look of unease, Hani asked, Is there a problem with that? The secretary stood and brushed himself off. He said in a hesitant voice, 
I hope Sathead Hura won't be disappointed. Mother just lives behind her shop. It's nothing like your house. Hani had noticed that Maya had never invited his bride to his mother's home, and now he was beginning to get a sense of why. Sadi knows she's a goldsmith. Why would she be disappointed? But Hani realized that Maya must harbor all sorts of anxieties about his artisan class birth, having married, as Maya had done, into the scribal class, where no one was ever permitted to forget that their way of life was best. Do you think we've wait raised her to care about such things? She loves and admires your mother. But she's never actually seen the house. She'll picture me growing up there, and it will make her think of how different our pasts were. His brow was pleated with insecurity. Hani clapped a fatherly hand on the little man's shoulder. Give her credit for seeing through that sort of thing, Maya. You're a scribe now, and that puts you in the ruling class. The more credit to you for having done it on your own. Thanks to you, my lord. Maya cast dog-like eyes, dog -like eyes of gratitude upon his father-in-law. Thanks to you for everything where I'd never have been able to stay in school. I'd be keeping mother's books in the back of the shop. Hani had served as Maya's patron, sponsoring the higher education of a promising student who wouldn't otherwise have been able to advance to the ranks of the House of Life. Touched by the young man's gratitude, but a little embarrassed too, Hani mumbled self-deprecating noises. It's you she's married, my friend, not your mother's house. Don't worry about it. If I'm wrong, I owe you a, a pot of beer. No, some of that wine I sent back from Kedney last year. Maya threw his head back and gave a great hoot of laughter. It's a deal, Lord Hani. He let himself out the door with a bit of the old swagger back in his steps. Hani was shaking his head in affection and pity at the sensitivity of the young when his wife, Nibnefer, glided in barefoot and silent from the back of the house. She was still trim and beautiful with great fringed black eyes and a perfectly bowed mouth. Ah, my dearest, there you are. He opened his arms to her, his heart expanding, and she pecked him on the cheek. Her face was puckered with the effort to control her laughter. Neferet has decided she wants to be a heron doctor. I thought you would be pleased. It's a step up from wanting to be a heron, Honey said with a grin. Our little girl is growing up. No point in even taking her ambition seriously at this age. They change every day. Perhaps, although it wouldn't be a bad thing to have a physician in the family. I mean, one who treats humans, not herons. Nebnefer looked at her husband wide-eyed. Do you mean that? Do you think she should really study medicine? He shrugged cautiously, feeling he had stepped into a trap. If that's what she wants, why not? But, Hani, who have who ever heard of a woman doctor? She made an exasperated noise. She might as well treat herons for all the patients she'd get. Yet there are such, my dear. I know I've heard of it. I think the priests of Sekhmet at Sao may accept girls for study. Demdefer gave him an accusatory look. Have you been encouraging her in this scheme, Hani? Because she said exactly the same thing. No, I, I swear, my love, today is the first time I've even heard she was interested. And maybe it's just a whim, but if she is interested, why shouldn't she pursue it? She's smart. Her lips pursing, Nebnefer hummed dubiously. Hani maintained a prudent silence until his wife finally blurted, as if ashamed to have to say it. Isn't it a little working class, a woman going to patients' houses with a basket of herbs? A village healer for the sake of the hidden one? Male doctors are scribes, my doe, and often priests. They have very elevated status. Wouldn't it be the same for women doctors? Hani didn't want to sound argumentative, so he used his best mild, reasonable, diplomatic voice. Who's going to teach a girl to read and write, Hani? Don't set her expectations high just to have them dashed in her face, please. Hani wanted to laugh, but he saw that Nebnefer was really concerned for her passionate little girl, so he said gently, her father, grandfather, both brothers, brother-in-law, and all her uncles know the speech of the gods, my dear. She won't lack for teachers. Nebnefer turned her eyes away, brows contracted. She murmured, It doesn't seem feminine to me. To me, the mystery has always been why doctors are male, when men generally have so little feeling for the sick or weak. I think a feminine touch would be much superior. Nebnefer seemed to debate with herself in silence, then she said stiffly, I see, I can't argue with you, my dear. Your mind is made up. Not at all, and it isn't my mind at stake here. It's Neferet's. She's only thirteen. She may very well change goals. In a year or two, she may prefer simply to get married and forget all about the scribal life. And that would be fine. But if she persists, I think we should support her. He turned Nebnefer's chin back toward him. Don't you? He smiled her at her beguilingly, and she seemed to soften in spite of herself. 
She'll probably be obsessed with some new scheme before the end of the year, Nebnever sighed, no doubt hoping it would be so, and shrugged. Connie bent to kiss the sweet slope between her shoulder and neck. He thought of Neferet groping to find herself, of Maya, so concerned that his wife think well of him and of his own eldest son, Aha, desperate to impress the king. I pity the young. Well, I pity the old, said his father, Mer Mary Ra, from the doorway. It's a hard walk here from Mariette Mamans in the sun. I told you to take my litter whenever you need it, father, said Hani in mock severity. But, oh no, you want to look manly in the sight of your lady friend. You are too proud. Mary Ra chuckled, his belly bouncing. Or too forgetful, I'm afraid I'd leave it there. I doubt if she'll break it up for firewood the first time that happens, said Nebnefer dryly. I leave you gentlemen to your mischief. I need to go cauterize some wounded animals. She headed for the rear of the house, but then at the door turned back. Would you go to a woman doctor to be treated, honey? She disappeared into the kitchen. Are you sick? Mary Ra looked at his son in surprise. No, no, it was a rhetorical question. Neferet has been talking about wanting to be a sonnet, and Nebnefer wants me to admit that no one would ever go to a female doctor. Women would, I th should think. I I'll bet the king's harem has a female doctor. Connie looked at him impressed. An excellent idea, my noble father. I may ask around. Mary Ra pursed his lips to hide a grin. The next time you're in the king's harem, eh? Hani set off for the bedroom, but his father called after him. What under the sun did she mean about cauterizing animals? With a laugh, Hani said over his shoulder, She's going to start lunch. It's a little medical humor. <laughs>